so hopefully this video doesn't come out until after that's released so we get a shot at that <laughs> i mean we can release this video whenever we want yeah hey welcome to super social club i'm jeremy this is whiskey in the six i'm rob welcome to the whiskey ramp podcast it's a little crusty it's frustrating and it's gonna be a little bit of a rant i don't understand it i don't know why some sort of injustice anyway and rant hello and welcome back to the whiskey ramp podcast i'm jeremy i'm rob tonight joined by special guests um uh, Bob and Tyson from Two Brewers Distillery, um, one distillery in Canada that we regard as probably up there, if not the best uh, maker of whiskey right now. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, we've sung your praises uh, to anyone that would listen for a long time. So it's it's a pleasure having both of you guys. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for inviting us. It's a pleasure to be here. Rob's been reviewing Two Brewers Whiskey before anyone even on this side of the uh, country knew what Two Brewers was. Uh, he was doing reviews probably way back in, what, six, seven years ago? It, maybe not that long, but uh, it's been a while. It's yeah. been a while. And yeah. and I, I mean, I was I feel like I was almost late to the party, though. Like, I mean, I, I do have some earlier expressions, but that being said... It, it, they've been around and I kind of, you know, I feel like I, I missed the boat for a while there. As far as like the YouTube whiskey community is concerned, though, you were really the only person reviewing two brewers at the time, for the most part. Yeah, for the, I mean, uh, Mark Whiskey Whistle was reviewing a bit of that, uh, mm -hmm. the the uh, two brewer stuff. Uh, and then I think Trenny and C, um, I'm not sure how early they got onto the onto the ship but well i mean uh, your passion towards this distillery was very like uh evident and we were always joked like oh does rob you like two brewers rob yeah, rob, rob likes two brewers <laughs> yeah um so we're missing one of the owners tonight uh which is quite all right because we have uh you two gentlemen and um bob if you don't mind like maybe share with the viewers how this all started uh, there's actually some people just listening instead of watching. So, um, yeah, how how this all started? What was the idea behind it? Where are you in, originally from? Because uh, the distillery, for those who don't know, is in Yukon, uh, Yukon Territories, which is northern Canada. So, uh, yeah, we started as a brewery, and we still uh, we're still a brewery. We uh, opened the doors in 1997, uh, so we've been making beer now for 27 or so years, and um, my partner, uh, Al Hansen, who is not with us tonight, uh, and I, um, uh, just as we were rolling, Al, who's a chemical engineer, almost on day one, said, you know what, someday we should buy a still. And <laughs> my answer was always, Al, we're, we're so broke <laughs> that uh, that's just not happening like any time in my lifetime. Um, and about once a year, Al would bring that up, and uh, slowly but surely, we got less broke. And um, and the idea of buying a still started to uh, to make a little bit of sense. So in 2007, when we were 10 years old, uh, we agreed to start doing some research on what might be involved. We really didn't know much about it other than Al, uh, as a chemical engineer, knew all about distilling and how the science worked. Um, so we went off to a class at... Uh, uh, Michigan State University um, that was put on by Christian Carl, who's a still maker in Germany. And um, in that class, we started to learn what was involved and started to realize that, you know what, we can probably do this. Um, the original plan, quite honestly, when we look back at the documents that we put together, um, talked about making clear spirits. Um, as you do, I think that when you when you start a brewery, you probably start thinking about how do we sell oodles of beer? We better be like Molson. And then we realized one day that Molson's like Molson. We shouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with uh, spirits. We should not try to make something fast. And, you know, uh, the vodka makers are pretty good at what they do. Um, what do we do in beer that works? And the answer was pretty simple. Uh, beer that has lots of flavor um, was somewhere where we were staking out our ground. And we thought, well, what's the equivalent if we're gonna, if we're gonna buy a still and make uh, distilled spirits, what's the equivalent? Um, and the answer was kind of twofold. One, single malt whiskey is, uh, is where lots of flavor 
um, not only works, but is appreciated. Uh, and number two, uh, we looked at each other and said, well, what do you drink? Do you drink vodka? And we both said, no. Uh, how about gin? No. Uh, do you drink whiskey? Oh, yeah, drink whiskey. So we thought, well, why wouldn't we make what we love? So um, so that's where it started. It was 2009 that uh, the spill came in. So it took us two years to kind of, uh, as we do, analyze it to death and uh, decide that we're going to jump off the edge of the cliff and spend more money on something else that we didn't really know how to do and uh, and bought a still and um, started making, uh, within a couple of days of it arriving, uh, we started making whiskey. So we're at least barreling whiskey. Yeah, so your your still is is uh, very unique in the distilling world, is it not? That there's like a compartment or chamber that was added on or something like that. I, I remember the story vaguely, but I can't remember exactly how. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the things that we got into when we went to Michigan State University and had a chance to talk to the guys who actually make the equipment um, was asking the stupid question. Well isn't the still basically just a big kettle? And the answer was yes. And we said, well, but we already own a kettle. We own a kettle to make beer with. Why don't we use that? Um, and the answer was, well, it's made out of stainless steel and you really need copper contact in order to knock back the sulfury tones. Uh, we said, okay, well, that makes sense. Um, what if we built something that sat on top of the kettle made out of copper um, to get that copper contact. And the fellows at Christian Carl said, well, that's not too bad an idea, but um, that's not a lot of copper contact. So we said, oh, yeah, good point. Um, what if we took that thing and filled it with copper wool? So a picture steel wool or grill pad, except made out of copper. Um, and that helmet, what we call it, that sits on top of the brew kettle, um, is packed with that copper wool. Uh, so lots and lots of copper contact and uh, uh, they said, well, you know, this might work. And we started sketching out how what it would look like. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, between us, we came up with a design that uh, that would work. Um, not knowing, well, the design would work. It would go on to the equipment. Would it actually function? We had no idea. But we thought, you know what? If you don't try, you don't know. So uh, so we bought the equipment and put it on there. And uh, I've been using it right, uh, right off the bat. Um, and the main advantage to that is that our brew kettle is much bigger than our still. Um, we could only afford a still of a certain size. Um, and uh, so we do our stripping runs actually in our brew kettle. And stripping runs, of course, are your first distillation. So we do the fermentation in the fermenters that we make beer with. Uh, and then we move it back over into the kettle with this modified helmet on top. Uh, do the stripping and then we take those low wines and move them over uh, to where the still is. And do the second distillation uh, in the actual still itself. That's really cool. I guess that's why they're you guys are so unique. Uh, it, we, whenever we talk about two brewers, we talk about how different it is than what's out there. Like yeah. there's this incredible fruitiness that's, um, you know, synonymous with two brewers. And it, I wonder if it's because of your unique distilling method that yeah i them. mean we always talk about how you know almost every single expression we've tried has this like unique distillery characteristic and in the distillate really does kind of shine through mm -hmm. especially with the classic releases i think yeah. i think a large part as well um what do you contribute that to i mean obviously you said when you made beer you know super flavorful beer I would love to try, you know, just the distillate, like the white dog off the still and see what that yeah. is. Because, I mean, I'm sure it's just full of fruit. Um, and you contribute your brewing style with beer to kind of what your distillate is like, like full of flavor. Uh, well, certainly one of the things that we talked about doing right off the word go and, uh, and have stuck to is uh, we know how to make beer. Let's make beer. Um, and turn it into whiskey. So essentially, we uh, our grain selection is all over the map. Um, in the same way that if we were making a stout, we would have an entirely different grain bill from making a lager. Uh, we will use those different grain bills to make the new make. So when you talk about the distillate, the white dog coming off the still, um, this batch might be made with uh, black malts or chocolate malts or Vienna malts or honey malts or on and on. Uh, this one might be made with pale malt only. 
Um, our reasoning was that if it tastes real different coming off the spill because of the grain, then it's going to taste real different later on. Yeah. Um, a lot of the reading we did said, no, no, it doesn't matter. All the flavor comes from the barrel, and it really doesn't matter what you make your alcohol with. Um, and we thought, well, that just doesn't make sense to us. So let's let's try this approach and see what happens. Um, and Jeremy nailed it. Um, the first couple of times we tasted the white dog coming off the spill, we looked at each other and said, this is real different. And, mm-hmm. and uh, it's got to turn into something, I don't know about good, because we didn't know. Um, yeah. But it's got to turn into something real different later. Uh, mm-hmm. If it's starting real different, it's going to finish real different. So um, I would attribute a lot of the, I'm not sure about the fruity flavors. I know exactly what you're getting at. Um, it's hard to know whether that comes from the grain or the equipment or the technique or the fermentation. Uh, we ferment to a fairly low alcohol level. So I leave a lot of the sugar in, uh, in the fermentation rather than uh, distilling them out um, to create more alcohol. Um, probably all of those things line up to contribute toward the final flavor or yeah, the final characteristic. Make, that would make sense. So you use many different types of malted barley and, and sometimes wheat. And um, are those the main two that you guys work with or are there other grains that you're working with as well? Yeah, those are the main two. We use a little bit of malted rye. Uh, we use just recently put down uh, an experiment with some malted oats. Um, oh, cool. I think that's about the four the four grains we've used. Uh, we we use a fair amount of peated malted barley. That's kind of the, the fifth category that is barley. Right. Can we right. talk about the release we're drinking, the release 42, the classic. Yeah, go for it. Uh, this is one of the newest classic releases. Is that right? 42? It is the newest classic. It's the newest yeah. classic release. in a combination of malts in this one, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There's uh, a lot of wheat in it and then uh, a lot of barley. So you're malting wheat and you're malting barley for this? We're buying malted wheat and malted barley. Yeah, yeah. right. We're using one combination of the two. Right. Where, are, are you sourcing from Alberta for most of your uh, grain selection or is, is that a trick, like secret of the trade or? No, no. Um, we use basically the same suppliers we use for our brewing malt. Um, so some of it, like the feed of barley does come from Scotland. Yeah. Um, um, we will use some specialty malts are imported, but a lot of the base malt is from Saskatchewan. And then a lot oh. of the uh, specialty malts are from uh, BC and Alberta, either uh, Gambrinus in uh, you know, the border region uh, does a lot of it. Uh, and then uh, across the prairies. Yeah, this release forty two is so good. I so mean, fruity. What do you so get? You get honey. You get you get vanilla. That, you get this like fruit note. It's like there's like it, the mango, melon, yeah, papaya, the, melon. Yeah, like yeah. a cantaloupe kind of. I, I like. I associate it with like mango and cantaloupe and like yeah stuff like that. It's very like Scotch whiskey forward. Like uh, like a something like an ex bourbon matured Scotch whiskey. You could be, I think, kind of confused if you if you gave this to someone and didn't tell them what it was. It's it's like a hybrid I find between some really good Scotch and really good Irish single malts. Mm, yeah. Um, and that's kind of like where I try to steer people when I'm talking about two brewers is, you know, to describe it. It has these like crazy fruity notes that you'll get off of like a an ex bourbon aged uh, Irish whiskey, right? But then it has like the maltiness and the like breadiness that you get from like some Scotch as well, right? So yeah, it's got that kind of like that triple distilled Irish kind of like soft creaminess to it as well. Yeah, I think what what makes it st- like and and I, I I'm very curious actually what ch- and I'm sure the answer is different for both of you. But I'm curious which uh, of the malted barleys you like to work with the most because I find that um, a couple of the expressions that have had chocolate malt in them like really hammer home that like fruity sweetness and that that robust like wide profile. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know when Tyson said that uh, that we use a lot of malted barley. He's bang on, but um, I would I would draw the distinction that while that malted barley is not just malted barley, um, it could be uh, honey malt. It, like it depends on how it's chilled. Uh, at the end of the day, is what I'm getting at. So yeah. 
Uh, some of the malts will use like a black malt or a chocolate malt or as, as dark as the wall behind you. Yeah. Um, and um, often we'll use Vienna malts or which a uh, Vienna malt is extremely bready uh, and even almost nutty. Um, and we're doing all that on purpose. Um, we don't, we want to a degree, we want every barrel in our pile to be a little bit different in the same way that if you were a, a painter, you would want every shade of blue to be a little bit different. It was all the same shade of blue. You'd have a pretty boring sky. Yeah. So um, that's what we're trying to create with all these different grains. Um, my personal favorites are, well, I, I guess I, I don't really have one in terms of, um, I find that all these different grains bring so many different things. It's, it's um, it's really amazing to me when we um, when we sample out of a barrel. Quite often, um, looking at what went into it and what we're tasting coming out of it is uh, it's quite an adventure. Awesome. When you're putting together a, a release like this, release forty two, the classic. How many barrels are you are you blending in, in for this? Is it is it a larger batch or something kind of smaller? So there's like that release forty two, for example, had about uh, five or six uh, different barrels in it. They're not necessarily full barrels. We're uh, frequently ending up with, we'll take 20 kilograms of a barrel or half a barrel, uh, just based on the final final number we want. We find people, you know, we want to do releases that get out there, but uh, we found that people are, are looking for the next release pretty quickly. So we try mm-hmm. to cycle through with, with some expediency. Right. Um What's the angel share like where you guys, cause obviously you guys are, are pretty far north. Um, do you experience a lot or is it not too much? Like your, your summers don't get too hot, your winters kind of cold or? Uh, yes, uh, we get pretty cold up here to the extent where we actually store all of our barrels uh, in a, a warehouse, so like in, in our warehouse, in our facility. Uh, we can't keep them outside because they actually, they're one of the few places where a barrel of whiskey could actually freeze. On, yeah. a, on the cold day. Um, and we don't know what that would look like. We don't want to see what that looks like. Um, our angel share is pretty high. We, uh, we're we um, a cold enough climate that it's, it's, it's intensely dry uh, year round. Mm-hmm. So there is, we lose a fair amount of alcohol and we lose even more water uh, okay. during, during the maturation. Like, so it's, it's so the ABV goes up similar to like a Kentucky bourbon would like the ABV would go up the water content would whereas I guess in Scotland it's more the other way around the the ABV goes down. So yeah. what's the what's the highest ABV that you've pulled a cask from like a single cask? Uh it's over 75%. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's straight the hazmat. Pretty, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um well, I guess that's why you haven't released a cash strength version of anything, right? <laughs> yeah, when we do higher strength, we definitely are still adding some water. water yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So it's too high for practicality, for sure. I mean, and you also have that beautiful water source, so I guess that that contributes to like not being afraid to add a little bit of water to your expressions. Because I mean, you guys, I guess when you go near cash strength, it's around fifty-eight, right? That's usually and any any reason why that number kind of like seems to be repeated or not necessarily any reason just there was probably a reason the first time around and then we just stuck to it <laughs> right it, it seems to be working out that you know we we trial each release at, at the release ABP and make sure we're happy with it we've done cast strength releases at 56 just thinking mm-hmm. this one needs a little bit of extra water so it's it's 58 is probably the starting point each time can you talk about the water? Because I think recently I was at a whiskey event and one person posed a question like, what's the most important ingredient in whiskey? And someone said water. Um, is water, like where does it rank if importance? If you, you could give it like a percentage on how important water is to the whiskey making process, what would you say? It's a great question. Um, whenever we're asked about how much impact the water has on our final product, we a little bit tongue in cheek, say we don't know because we've never made it without it. Right. Um, I don't know what it would taste like sure. otherwise. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
it's very um, it's very mineralized water and has always made great beer. We've always had success in winning beer awards. Um, how much does it impact it? It's, I would say it's really hard to say. We're really happy with it in terms of what it brings, the, the mineralization that's in the water. Um, how much does it bring? I I just I just I couldn't answer. Yeah, I I answered the question. I said the whiskey maker is the most important ingredient in the whiskey making process. Yeah. Um, I mean, anyone can source some good grain, anyone can buy a decent barrel, but if your new make isn't, isn't great, it doesn't matter about anything else. I think. Yeah. I think, I think the water is an X factor though, because, um, not everybody has access to good water. Like, right. you know, uh, for example, city of Toronto water, it's good water. It's well filtered, but it's well filtered no glacier water there's no glacier water Kentucky that's line thousands of water. years old sure. that hasn't been touched by anyone and yeah. you know um so i guess yes i i think i don't know i kind of agree with i mean the water i don't think that the water is the most important thing but i do think it it's plays up there. a huge factor yeah um moving on to this release 43 um, for the viewers who don't know, you have four main releases, a classic, a peated, special finishes, and an innovative series. Um, you said before the peated, you're you're getting peated barley from Scotland. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm just going to quit. Like, I know how old these are. Is that okay to share that information or? Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So um the youngest stuff, which actually happens to be the smallest amount of, of uh, the portion of whiskey in this 42 is 10 years old. And then it's uh, 11 year old and 13 year old in the, in the 42. And the, the um, 43 is 100% single malt uh, barley. Uh, yeah. Malted barley, uh, peated malted barley. And it's, Majority nine year old, uh, with twenty percent, I think ten year old or something like that. Um, my question is, before we get into like how good both of these are, and you could talk a little bit about the peated, um, is, is this something that we're gonna come to expect from now on with like the ages of these? Like they they seem to be creeping up into the nine ten year old range. Uh, is that something that's gonna be a regular thing? Is there enough? Uh, and then also, what what is the oldest whiskeys that you have in your distillery right now, or your warehouse, I should say? Yeah, so the ages of the whiskeys have definitely been creeping up. We're obviously no age statements uh, intentionally, uh, because we it's not always the case that older is better. Uh, we know that consumers, some consumers, will feel that way. So as soon as we pick a seven year old on a whiskey that is eighty percent ten year plus. You're, you're going to kind of change the perception. Mm -hmm. um, but in general, our whiskeys have been creeping up over years um, in age, just as, uh, as older, land, or older, older mashes become available to us. Um, and that's no reason to think that won't continue. Um, as long as, like, we're not, we're not scared to put something younger into a, a blend of some older stuff. Uh, that improves it in our eyes. Um, but having those older whiskeys is, is definitely nice. There's lots of, lots of nice stuff that takes a long time to, to develop. In the barrel. Um, as far as the oldest stuff, we still have uh, barrel one. So our, our oldest barrel is still there, going back to 2009. Um, huh. No idea what we're going to do with it. Uh, we do, uh, like we released 44 uh, PX finish, uh, special finish, uh, just went into our store uh, a couple of days ago. I don't know when people will see this, but when we're talking, it's a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, going back to our fourth and our fifth mash, the majority of the, the liquid in there. So that's pushing for, I think it's 14 years old. Oh, uh, wow. At age statement. And then some younger whiskey again blended in there uh, to, to brighten things up. But uh, it's definitely, there's some, there's some whiskey that's pretty old that's uh, finding its way into it. Yeah, I guess what like when you said your angel share is is quite substantial, um, you know, maybe getting up to pushing, you know, 15, 16, 17 years might be the max 
you guys might see in, in barrels like that? Like, is your first barrel like yeah. quite full or? So uh, the, I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, my guess is no. My guess is no, it's not quite full. <laughs> uh, we have tried to unbarrel and rebarrel some of those old mashes mm -hmm. just as the ABV climbs to start extracting different things. Do we want to debarrel them, add some water, get them down to a nice ABV again, and then, right. and then come back into a barrel to continue aging? So we've tried to stay on top of that. Uh, right. We're losing a lot of liquid. And then we've also found, I don't know if it's, like I mentioned that the barrels are inside all the time. I think we tend to have a pretty, a little bit of a quick maturation because they're always at room temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, they don't get super hot, but they also don't get down into those, those kind of low temperatures, uh, which might slow things down. Um, and uh, so we found that as, as some of our whiskeys get a little bit older, they almost start to over mature. That, that you start to find flavors that maybe it was actually tasted a little bit better a couple of years ago, or it's just kind of, of gone a direction you didn't necessarily want it to. So I'm not sure that uh, we'll we'll keep aging things indefinitely beyond just right. the, the novelty of being able to do a, an age statement that's uh, a big number. Will there will there be a time where you guys move away from the the numbered releases and in, introduce a, some sort of like a core range kind of thing, or will this always kind of be the pattern, like just counting up and until a, a, a infinity or whatever. Yeah. That's exactly the conversation we've had is that at some point that number gets so high, it feels a little bit unwieldy. Like, do we really want to see release 147 on the shelf? Is that making sense for a consumer? Um, so we, we we feel we need to move away from it at some point, but we are still governed by the the original limitation, which is that we only have so many barrels. We can't make the same thing over and over again. Uh, we don't really want to make the same thing over and over again. We want to keep exploring all these new and interesting flavors without being beholden to to putting out the same line of whiskey over and over again. Right. Um, so I think I'm pretty confident we will at some point move away from the number of releases what exactly we'll move into uh the only thing we know about that is that it won't be uh won't be the same once we over and over again right maybe like a vintages or something like that yeah. um so yeah we're drinking this release 43 the peated sourced peated barley 50 percent abv 50 percent well. abv it's really interesting um to get this heated version of your whiskey and it, it just it marries very very well and i think this release i mean you were saying that I mean, this might be your favorite one you've had so far of the peated of yeah. the peated yeah well so i should i should preface that because there was i had an opportunity to do um to try a few samples uh for a store that was thinking about it didn't end up working out, but the barrel I tried, the, the peated barrel that I tried out of those was, I would put that up against pretty much any peated whiskey in the oh, entire yeah. world. Wow. And, and think it would win wow. the, like triple gold. So, <laughs> um, I, I hope, I mean, I, Bob probably knows which cask that was, or at least he could probably look it up. Um, I hope something uh, special comes from that one because, I can't, I mean, maybe I've already tried it in one of the releases, but that one was, it was a special single cask, but I mean, it's not really a fair comparison because that's a single cask versus a blended, like right. a, a blend of casks. Right. So, yeah. uh, but this is definitely up there. It's really, really good. Yeah. What are the challenges of using like a, a peated um, barley? Um, I think maybe the biggest challenge for us is just kind of getting the, the right kind of peat flavor to come through. Uh, we, we are pretty happy with a lot of the, the peated blends we put together, but they don't get into the kind of real peat head flavors. They're more of a, a leather and a tobacco and, and ashes, um, which again is, is I think we're 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 getting the best out of out of the distillate we're finding. But I don't know how we increase the uh, the peatiness of it to, to mm -hmm. really satisfy the the special peat lovers. 
What's the uh, PPM level? Do you, are you guys are you given that when you buy the barley, or are you like can you choose from various PPM levels? Uh, yeah, we get it uh, on the barley we buy, but it's pretty wide range. Um, it's uh, I think thirty five to sixty PPM. That's okay. What we're calling it's we special order the extra heavily peated stuff, um, so that we know we can blend it back uh, with unpeated whiskey. Um, nice. But uh, there's there's some secret sauce in there to get the the crazy peatiness that some of those uh, high uh, distilleries get. We don't we don't want to do that. Yeah, is that the is key? Actually... Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was I was gonna say, is that the key to like to go as heavy as you can and then blend it back because you don't want to risk maybe not having it, uh, not having the peat be that influential. You you want to go heavier and then blend it back versus going the other way around. That's our typical approach. We've definitely done some uh, mashes that have a partial peat mash uh, for specific reasons. Sometimes we're casking something specifically for a potential single cask release. So we'll kind of combine. We're intending to not blend that. So we want to kind of do the blending when we do the mashing. Um, right. And then sometimes we just do a, a lesser peat just to see, see how it changes. But the general, uh, uh, direction is that we figure we can always blend out the piece we know we can't add more piece later yeah yeah again like um this peated release is like it's a it's a softer rounder uh peat like you said before like the nice like leathers the ashiness like a little barbecue yeah a note on it. it it is it is uh i would say like a more like a delicate if you compare it to like the heavy hitters of scotland this is a more creamy roundier uh peated scotch it's there's a while. there's a little bit of a like um i don't know if you if you guys have ever done this before but you you cut a peach you, you basically have a peach and and you barbecue it no but on a charcoal barbecue yeah that's kind of what i'm getting on uh, yeah i totally agree because you still you can again with like like we said before that you still get the uh, distillery characteristic coming through yeah with almost every release i think and uh Absolutely. You, you get it with this one as well but would you attribute uh, attribute some of that to your to like what, what would you say like a typical fermentation time is is it like would you say that yours are longer than usual or i don't know what's usual honestly because i've pretty much just come up doing what we do. Um, but we take about a week. So I think it probably is on the, the longer side of normal, especially uh, we only go up to about 10% ABV. I think a lot of uh, a lot of whiskeys will go higher. So we're uh, maybe taking a little bit longer, but we're not going nearly as far. Right on. This, um, this expression that this release that Jeremy's pouring right now is uh, one that I I think I'm on my last bottle of, which is really sad because I bought about five of them. <laughs> and uh, it's release 28, which I don't know, for whatever reason, I think, I think it was because it's, it's the, I, I, I purchased and I hunted down a second bottle of release 24 and like kind of, the most eye-opening like moment in whiskey in the six like time period was release 24 for me because mm -hmm. i remember trying that thinking like these guys have the opportunity here like with this like producing stuff like this they're gonna be known as one of the best distilleries in the entire world yeah uh, and I, I've gone on record saying some crazy things and people are holding me to it. So you guys got to prove <laughs> me, right? <laughs> uh, but this one was supposed to be like the most similar to that release 24, uh, this release 28. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're singing your guys' praise. I mean, I think that when people think like Canadian whiskey, they automatically go to like the biggest producers and they think about, you know, a rye corn hybrid that mixes well yeah. with a soft drink. Um, yeah. This whiskey, the stuff that you guys are making redefines Canadian whiskey for a modern take and kind of puts it on a world map. I think that can compete with the best stuff of any country that's producing whiskey. Yeah. And I think it's the single malt. Like I, 
it's just for us, like we're big single malt fans. So we're glad that Canada is like heading in a more direction of focusing on single malt. And I mean, I don't think anyone's doing it better than you guys are right now. Yeah. I mean, okay. To add to that, um, I think what's great about the, the four or five single malt distilleries that I really like in Canada um, that specialize, I should say, in single malt is that they're all so different. Mm -hmm. they're all so different like you guys are incredibly different from macalonis which has a very like scotch focus like uh style let's say uh you know and then shelter point again a different completely direction like everyone tastes very different and i think that's a great thing because yeah it, it, then you don't necessarily compete with each other either you're not trying to make the exact same thing you're making very different things and that makes the, the community as a whole grow right um and we're loving we're loving this stuff so um release 44 tell us a little bit about that because that's coming out or it's out sorry it's out already and we i actually almost pulled the trigger on it today uh but i got sidetracked at work so <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Of buying a good whiskey. All the time. Actually, kind of a good thing when work gets in the way here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Tyson knows more about 44 than I do. Uh, yeah, just uh, another Sherry Finish release. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, it's really uh, some of our oldest whiskey. And uh, a really uh, a lot of depth of, of, of oak character that's Honestly, I had to I had to blend that a little bit. It was, it was uh, borderline as getting into some astringent bitter stuff. That uh, it takes a lot of time for a lot of, a lot of contact time between oak and whiskey to get to that point. And we had to we had to brighten it up a little bit. But uh, I really uh, a bit of a I was I was actually having some there night. And I thought uh, it's a bit of a a, a flip. On some of our other sherry finished whiskeys, where for whatever reason there's a really bright kind of cherry character to it hmm. um, from the sherry, uh, whereas a lot of times I find, especially our PX uh, finishes, get you know more darker fruits. So there's a real depth and character from the oak, and then this brightness from the uh, from the fruit, as opposed to a real deep, dark, rich fruit flavor. And then kind of brighter maltiness. So I thought that I think it's a really nice uh, uh, take on the on PX finish. Awesome. Uh, yeah, Tyson, I, would, sorry. I would say sorry. Uh, I would Go say ahead. that the first time I tried it, it just it surprised me. Um, in fact, I I asked Tyson if he was sure that he had the the right notes beside it because uh, it was definitely that fruitiness from the sherry. But um, I always think of it as kind of a big date, really deep, deep sweetness um and this was not that when tyson talks about cherries black cherries um it's all over that one um and uh he's right it's a flip on our normal and uh it's a good flip tyson. nice that's awesome so tyson tell us a little bit more about your role right now with two brewers uh, and how long like is it relatively new it has it been a couple years now how, how long have you been in this role with two brewers uh it's relatively new um about two years now um i started uh here full-time about seven years ago and they were looking for a little bit extra help on the distilling side and uh i have a, a, a background in chemical engineering so I had a little bit of a, a knowledge base for that sort of the processes for the chemistry um and just kind of as uh, as alan he's a uh, Alan has pretty much wound back his day to day here to zero. So as he was doing that, uh, he was looking for somebody to take over the whiskey. And slowly handed it off uh, over probably the last five years. Then about two years ago, he uh, he stopped showing up. So I've been uh, I've been looking after it. So and what does that look like? That's like the distilling, the blending, all of it, or how does that work? Yeah, yeah, we have a couple other distillers, a couple other uh, people who are. Uh, running the bottling lines and, and running the still, uh, we have just our regular brewers who are who are making the washes. Um, that's that's always been the case. We have uh, plenty of people with uh, a good amount of, of skill in the, you know, the kind of 
industrial whiskey making processes, beer making processes. So I lean pretty heavily on those guys. But uh, when it comes time to blend stuff up, when it comes time to to design all of the whiskey that we're making for you know nine, ten, eleven years from now, uh, that's all me. Very cool. Uh, one question I always like to ask whiskey producers: uh, when you're not drinking your own supply. What's in your cabinet at home? What do you guys lean to? Are you Scotch drinkers, bourbon, other Canadian stuff? What's uh, what do you go to when you're not drinking two brewers? Well, for me, if I'm not drinking two brewers, uh, I probably got a bourbon. Yeah. Um, only because I really, you know, back when we got into this, I knew nothing about bourbon. I had no appreciation for bourbon, and I uh, probably like a lot of neophyte bourbon drinkers, I kind of found it a little bit challenging um, until my palate got it figured out um, and now I love it. So, nice. so yeah, I would probably lean toward a bourbon. Yeah, I, I find that uh, I almost always get my fill of whiskey during my, my work day. <laughs> um, so I don't, uh, I don't drink that much at home, but uh, when I do, I try to, I try to honestly be mindful of, uh, of uh, benchmarking as to, as to what else is going on. So like, uh, uh, last week, I opened up a bottle of uh, Sons of Vancouver, Palm Trees and Tropical Breeze. Uh, nice, uh, nice to see what else is going on in Canada. Uh, yeah. I'll try to to pick up a good Scotch every now and then, and just uh, that's kind of the North Star is what they're doing in Scotland for us, and uh, so you know, try and keep a uh, perspective on what else is going on with there. Very cool. Scotch, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say that if a, uh, a a bottle of whiskey turns up here that I don't know where it came from, uh, I can be sure that Tyson found it somewhere and read about it and, and sourced it out and uh, wanted to, you know, heard some different things or some good things or some comments that made him curious. And the next thing you know, a bottle of it turns up for, uh, for tasting. Although I will say there's about 40 bottles of whiskey behind us that are barely cracked. <laughs> we better get busy. Yeah, that's a problem that we all have, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> too much whiskey, too little time. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say, there's there's one bottle uh, of two brewers, uh, one of the releases that we don't have in front of us, and that's the Innovative Series. Do you guys have an innovative release in the works that's coming up next that you can, you can talk about? Or We do have an innovative release that's in the works, but I actually don't know if I want to talk about it yet. Okay. Uh, a little bit something different than what we've been doing, and I don't okay. know if I want to... I want to spill the beans quite yet. Um, the last one we did was uh, uh, the release 40 that was in barrels that had previously held coffee beans. The coffee um, beans, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, that's uh, a new one. Um, I think the next one we're going to try, it's a little bit of a, a lark. We'll see if it works out or not. Uh, it's potentially using some of the uh, wash from a new whiskey to... Uh, as part of the deep proofing process for uh, mm, interesting know. is playing around with that kind of stuff like a really cool thing um are you kind of like f concerned that stuff won't turn out it has any innovative um project not turned out where you've had to either like redistill it or figure out something to do with it they have so far all turned out eventually yeah so there's there's always the backup plan like we have a, a couple of old sour mashes um, I think we did eventually do a sour release. It was a while ago, um, but uh, we had some sour mashes that, that we taste them a lot before we decided that they were starting to come around. And a lot of them have been used in in little bits here and there to, to kind of build character in another whiskey, but uh, not necessarily deserving of a of being the star of the whiskey. Yeah. I think it does go to the uh, the fact that we're brewers first, and and that's why it's in our name. Um, and the idea that we, you probably all had, you probably had beers that are sour beers, uh, pretty popular style these days. And we thought, well, what if, uh, we sour a wash and, uh, then distilled it. And that was, uh, that goes back a long time now, but, uh, we did exactly that. Um, and you asked the question about tasting the uh, new make as it comes off the still. And that was one that we tasted. Uh, and our, I, I clearly remember Al and I standing there tasting what was coming off the still and looking at each other going, oh, my God, we'll never be able to use this not in 100 years. It is the weirdest thing, weirdest set of flavors ever. 
And we actually had the conversation, do we dump it now or do we dump it into a barrel and dump it later? And we decided, well, if you don't dump it in a barrel, you won't know. So we put it in a barrel and it did take a few years until we started to take samples from that barrel and say, you know, there's something going on here that's actually kind of good and kind of useful. Um, it's not what I expected. So, you know, hats off to the barrels. They're uh, uh, they're a magician when it comes down to taking X and turning it into Y. Right. Huh. Very cool. Interesting. So um, maybe let's let's talk a little bit about where where we're headed with two brewers. Is there a, a plan to I, I remember having a conversation, I think it was with you, Bob, um, where we spoke about how many barrels are put away a year. And at the time, I think it was around 20, 48 or 24. 48 is a big year for us. Uh, 48, 40, right? Probably more typical, yeah. 48 would be a, a big year. Yeah, not a lot. So is that is that still kind of the practice or are, are you guys, have you increased since? What's... What's the uh, amount of barrels that you guys are putting away a year now? I would say it's still the practice. I think, uh, you know, as we talked about earlier on, we use all our brewing equipment to make whiskey, uh, both to create the fermentation in the first place and then to do the stripping. We have to take the brew house back apart and stick that crazy helmet on top. Um, we're at a time of year now where we, we really can't do it. Uh, we're so hard pressed to make beer. Uh, summer's coming, tourists are coming, and uh, the beer consumption goes up. Uh, so we'll start uh, making whiskey again at the end of summer. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're, without changing the way we do it, which we could do, uh, but without changing the way we do it, we're pretty well pretty well limited to that. Um, I will say that we, uh, we pulled Al out of his semi-retirement and given him a task to go through Barrel starting at barrel number one huh. and pulling out samples from each one and putting together some tasting notes for each one because, of course, we know what went into it. We have notes from uh, of what we were tasting over time, uh, but over time might be five years ago for any specific barrel or even longer. Um, we want to know what each one tastes like and which ones want to be a special single cast release, if any. Uh, so we're we're exploring that, and it's, it's fun to uh, no one better to get to do that than Al, who uh, probably created the recipe 15 years ago anyway. So he should be the one who's uh, who's seeing what did it become. Um, knowing Al's mind, he remembers making it. So mm. um, <laughs> so it'll be interesting to see what he uh, what he finds in the little treasure trove of barrels. Interesting, very cool. Yeah, I mean, we we were talking with. Um... Sons of Vancouver, and they were talking about upping their production, and I think they tried to like double their production, and and the results really weren't what they were expecting. So I guess it, it makes sense to just keep things as they are if if that's what works. Yeah. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix or it. Or maybe just keep the whiskey production exactly the same and just start brewing beer in a different facility because. We want the <laughs> we want the two brewers whiskey to uh to not to change because this is fantastic stuff. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's the the fear, right? If you switch up, like it, you know, you put so like you buy a new warehouse with new stills and all this other stuff, and try to compete with a like a market that's not kind of what you've been doing for the last fifteen years or whatever it's been. You you run the risk of changing your whiskey right right so i guess that's kind of you know like jeremy said just just maybe open up another just, just start brewing beer, beer somewhere yeah. else yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's all we yeah. well it's interesting because I mean, it's obviously a question for tyson um i've been pretty happy with my involvement in in both beer and whiskey making over the years and i'm obviously uh um going to be out the door before he is uh, one way or another um, so those decisions will be his in time, but for me, I would never change a thing because whiskey's always been fun and I, I would hate it to be so, uh, productive or production related, uh, that it wasn't fun anymore and that sales mattered and not that they don't, you can't go broke while we're, you know, uh, 
having this money pit that uh, that we don't want to have. But by the same token, uh, for me, it's all about the liquid. 100% about the liquid. It's nice to get paid for it from time to time, but it's all about all about the liquid. I know Al and I used to joke that uh, as we were putting this pile of barrels together, which uh, it was seven years uh, before we sold the first drop, but we just kept putting barrels aside at, at the cost of, that was involved in making barrels, uh, that one of these days we'll retire either based on the sales of this whiskey or we'll just drink it, one or the other. That's our, <laughs> that's our two options. <laughs> That's like us for the collecting whiskey too. We either yeah. just drink it one day or just sell it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, which probably will be the the former rather than the latter. Yeah. Drink right. it one day. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um very cool. Uh, you know, really appreciate having you guys on. If you guys wanna like share anything that's coming up that you know, uh will get mega fans like me excited you're more than welcome to that or you can tell everybody where to find your whiskey which is important as well yeah well we have uh we mentioned at least 44 of px finished it just uh was released here middle of may i don't know when people actually here will see this but it uh will be available through brewerswhiskey.com um we've we've just opened up a, a national shipping on there so we have forever struggled to uh to get whiskey into the hands of people uh, east of Alberta, and uh, that's finally open to us. And uh, we actually have a very small single cast release coming out uh, probably in the next couple of days, actually. Mm, oh, wow. Uh, that is a uh, 40% live barrel that uh, we, we really like. So that will be 45, and then uh, got some ideas for release 46. So those are it's a little far afield. We've, uh, we've just done four four or five so so hopefully this video doesn't come out until after that's released so we get a shot at that <laughs> i mean we can release this video whenever we want yeah i was just gonna say if anyone controls that i think i know who it is <laughs> I mean, uh, if if we could, if you could put a couple aside for us to buy, then we'll release it sooner rather than later. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think it, it should be in the in the online store by the end of the week. So okay, be awesome, good. very cool, awesome. Um, what about your beer? Because like we haven't tried the beer. I would love to try. I have. It. I have tried. Yeah, you have tried. Uh, it. Dave uh, from Alberta, the uh, one of Yukon's reps. Um, yeah sent me some beer so can you buy I the beer share, the same obviously. places you can buy the whiskey then more or less okay it's, um the whole distribution system in canada is weird uh, no kidding probably yeah. covers all of it uh, uh so we do have some stores that have both whiskey and beer more likely to be found in alberta than bc uh we generally speaking other than our online store do not ship east of alberta um, we do have whiskey in France and we have whiskey in Scotland, which is kind of fun. Um, but it's a lot easier to get whiskey into Europe than into other provinces, quite honestly. That's crazy. Uh, not yeah. trying to be, uh, not trying to, you know, slag anybody. It's just the reality of it all. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's where we're at right now. Yeah. Fair enough. Hopefully that will change and that, um, Canada will, open up provinces to uh accepting of free trade between all different provinces because like i mean why not especially yeah, when it's yeah. We, yeah it's made in made in canada you should be able to buy it throughout canada without any red tape or hurdles to cross absolutely i had a just to add to that i had a two brewer stout chocolate stout i think it was which was absolutely bonkers yeah yeah it was yeah phenomenal. i need to do that i need to have a beer and then a whiskey i think is is the, is the proper way to do it side by side yeah, yeah. It is, um, uh, because uh, uh you, you mentioned dave in alberta and dave's been with us forever he's a great guy um but it's a staple of his that if he does a whiskey event that he's got beer there because he says he's the most popular guy in the room about half an hour before it closes when people have been sampling whiskey all night and they just want a beer. Yeah. <laughs> Dave always does that. Always. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was a, a pleasure for us to talk to you guys. Um, if you're watching this and you want to venture into two brewers, any of them on the releases is great. I yeah. think that the classic will really give you a really good idea of what the distillate is like and how yeah. it's so unique. 
Um, and then, you know, the peated, if you're a peat head, definitely go for that. Special finishes are amazing. If you like something always innovative, always really and the innovatives is so, is so, uh, is so out there and, and so unique, yeah. um, really cool stuff as well. Well, thanks to you guys for, uh, for your interest. It's, uh, there's nothing more fun than talking whiskey with whiskey people. So, uh, so thanks for doing this. Uh, it's, it's, it's truly our pleasure. And, uh, we look forward to every two brewers release and i'll be probably uh making a purchase later on, later on this week unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately for my bank account than... <laughs> but uh yeah no that's great I'm, I'm excited for it thank you so much guys yeah thanks really guys very really much appreciate it and uh, have a good one cheers thanks a lot you guys you take care cheers, cheers. Tonight.